So it's my distinct pleasure right now to introduce our senator, Senator Patrick Gallivan. And uh, Senator Gallivan was first elected to the state senate in 2010, and his district represents all or parts of Erie, Wyoming, Livingston, and Monroe counties, including the great town of Henrietta, where we are today. Senator Gallivan has really focused on reducing the size and cost of government in upstate, and focused on upstate New York economic development and job creation and government reform as his top legislative priorities, hence the topic of today's program. In the Senate, Senator Gallivan serves on the Committee on Economic Development and Small Business, the Transportation Committee, the Higher Education Committee, the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee, and the Science, Technology, Incubation, and Entrepreneurship Committee, among others. So it's really good of you to take the time to come today. I don't know how you keep that busy schedule, but um, he is chairman of the Crime Victims, Crime, and Corrections Committee as well. Prior to taking office, Senator Gallivan served with the New York State Troopers and was twice elected sheriff of Erie County. He is the founder and owner of a private investigations firm as well. Please join me in a warm welcome for Senator Gallivan. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thanks, Deb and Dr. Nasser. Where are you? Raise your hand. He has a long, fancy title here at RIT, but he's in charge of this, in charge of the building and, and the institute. And RIT has been great, and we thank, uh, thank you for your partnership, along with the Henrietta Chamber of Commerce. Bob Smith is somewhere. There you go. And Laura Lane is from the Livingston County Chamber, and I don't know if she is here yet. Uh, but they worked with us, and Annie Chuico, who represents us, in both Monroe County and Livingston County work to put this together. And, and I do appreciate our partners and, and Annie's work. And Annie is our face here in Henrietta um, and in, in Livingston County as well. And she is helped by my father, Dick Gallivan, uh, down in Livingston County as well. But I have to tell everybody, he is a volunteer. He does not get paid. <laughs> and you can do it on Look Up New York if, if you want to make sure. But I'm, I'm very excited about this, um, and I'm thrilled to see so many people here. Uh, we had, I, I think we were planning for 65. The fire marshal gave us permission, as I'm told from Debbie, that to have a, a few more people in the room, uh, but we had a waiting list. And, and so it's, it seems to me that um, there's a need for something like this and for communication um, at, at all different levels. Um, I, I'm hoping that today that you, you're able to take something out of this. Um, certainly, I'll try to share some information about some of what my priorities are. And when I say my priorities, my priorities should be your priorities. I've worked very hard, we're in our third year now, at trying to legitimately be a representative for people in the district, whether it's the taxpayer, whether it's the educator, whether it's the student, the small business owner, and try to make my decisions based upon what's best for the people I represent. Um, the ideal thing would be that every time I vote, I vote how you would vote, or how we, you would want me to vote. So we've worked hard to, to go through the district and meet with as many people as possible, chambers, uh, chambers, educators, small businesses, and so on, to try to get a feel for the things that people think are important. Um, and clearly, from the time I made the decision to run for the Senate, um, very clearly, as I campaigned, I moved throughout the four different counties. Uh, then and now, it was very clear, number one on people's minds were jobs and taxes. Jobs and taxes, you hear it all the time. The question is, I think, is, is trying to do something about it. So I've made that my priority. Um, you, you heard a little bit about my background, and I'm glad, Debbie, that you did mention my background, because. You talked about all those business committees and then talked about crime and corrections, and you're thinking, how does crime and business go together? Uh, but, but you hear my law enforcement background. I suppose, how does crime and politics go together, too, when you see some of the things that, that actually go on here? Let me get back here. So, so my background, of course, led to the, the crime and corrections committee. And, and I was a trooper. Uh, I worked in Henrietta. For, for a number of years, so it was really neat with redistricting 
that Henrietta was included in our district along with, along with Wheatland, but I had worked for the state police right across from the old town hall when it was in those old trailers that you got rid of. <laughs> um, I wish it was still there though. Uh, and, and the town of Henrietta was a great host for us in the state police, but made a lot of friends. And so it was renewing acquaintances and it was really wonderful to come back. But I went from the state police to become the elected sheriff of Erie County and I served two terms. Um, administered an approximate $85 million budget and we had about 1,100 employees, full service law enforcement. We were second largest in the state, 14th largest sheriff's office in the country. And that was really my first introduction into managing a budget. I didn't have that responsibility at all in the state police. And really my first introduction um, when I was moving around the community to many small business owners and CEOs, and I had a great deal of respect for them. Then I left, I left and moved on, and we started our own company, and wow, what a difference. So I had the respect for the business owners. I had absolutely no idea what they faced and what they faced in New York State until I had my own business. And in part, that was, that was why I decided to run for the Senate. So we go back, and if you remember a few years back, you had $14 billion in taxes and fees. Uh, for, and they taxed everything, probably many different things in your businesses, but the one that got me, and I meant to bring something to illustrate the point, and I didn't, but I'll tell the story anyway. So we happen to, to be one of the businesses, uh, there aren't many that don't collect taxes anymore, uh, even though we were providing a level of professional services and not a, a separate product, not merchandise, but we had to collect sales tax. So just like this room here, we move into an office, it's remodeled and it's nice, decorated walls. We've got our picture from the paper. We've got the different awards and all these different things. And then it comes time, it comes time when we went from one year to the next where you had to get your, your certificate of authority to collect sales tax renewed. And for those of you that did this during this time period, you might remember, they used to have it. It was only an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper piece of construction paper, but they had pictures of Niagara Falls, they had pictures of the Adirondacks. And so in that 09 and 010, with the $14 billion of taxes and fees, you now upon renewal had to pay for the privilege of collecting taxes for New York State. And in my case, I know there's a cutoff somewhere, I forget exactly where it was, it was $50. So it's only $50, but it's still the point of it. 50 more dollars that they're taking. And then on these nice remodeled walls, they send you a bright orange construction paper certificate to go on the wall that doesn't match anything. We, we had some issues like, like many around the same time and we had to lay some people off and they were collecting unemployment and it was time to bring them back. So several of them came back, no problem at all, but there was one person in particular that was resisting coming back. When they were laid off, they knew that they were going to come back approximately a certain date, two or three months down the road. And so it was time to come back. They didn't want to. Our company email, uh, everybody of course, I and mean, we had a policy that you can only do the company related things probably like many of you. And we monitored what took place because with, the, with private investigation, you can't compare it to being a lawyer or a doctor because you don't have that privilege. But nonetheless, on our end of it, it, it was a misdemeanor if we revealed any information from our clients. So of course, we monitored what went on. So, this woman doesn't want to come back and I start looking at her email and turns out she's working under the table. Um, she is working with somebody to try to take business away from us. She's babysitting on Tuesdays and Thursdays for however many dollars. So what are we? We're private investigators. I put someone on a camera, they go out, they start videotaping her and we get her. We got the kids coming in and out. We've got actually at the front door cash changing hands and at the unemployment hearing, which we contested and we kept losing it every step, kept appealing. At the unemployment hearing, we got there and I presented to the hearing officer and the hearing officer, not in these words, says, it doesn't matter for the purposes of today's hearing if she's committing a crime. You'll have to take, up, take that up somewhere else. But you didn't give her a specific date to come back. You're not, you didn't pay her. I was paying this, this receptionist $15 an hour and they said that she, she had the title of uh, executive assistant. There's a prevailing wage for unemployment that's $19 an hour. Who pays a brand new person $19 an hour? 
Now, rookie mistake on our part, we should have been paying her $10 an hour. Anyway, she got unemployment and she's breaking the law. And so we still try to follow through. They don't want anything to do with it. And then finally, we, <clears throat> like, like many of you, if you're a corporation or an LLC, you, you file that with the New York State Department of State Division of Corporations. We did the same thing. And in our case, our license comes through the Department of State Division of Life Licensing. And just like the tax cer certificate, both of them have to be up on the wall. So we've got them up on the wall. A auditor comes through. And it, the licensing just routinely audits our industry. I don't know if, if you have them uh, or some of you have them or not. But the auditor comes. And we had changed our name. We went simply from GDY to GDY Professional Investigations. And we called the Department of State Division of Corporations, says we're notifying you, we're changing our name, what should we do? Send us a fax, what should we do with, with our certificate? Well, just hand write it in, and then when you get the renewal, it'll come to you, you put it up on the wall. So we did that. Then we take our license, same thing, we hand write it in on the wall. Now, shame on us. Um, and probably like many of you in many small businesses, you don't have the luxury to have your own attorney on staff. And, and we didn't. So the auditor comes in and first thing is he, he walks in and he walks around and he looks on the wall where you have to have all that labor stuff, the minimum wage and all that stuff, so on, all those notices, the EEO notices and all that. Then he goes and he looks at our paperwork on the wall, sees the nice bright orange tax thing out, I see you have that. Then he looks at our license and says, well, why do you have that name written in? Well, we changed our name. You didn't notify us. Well, yes, we did. No, you didn't. Yes, we did. We notified the Department of State, Division of Corporations. And the auditor says, they're in a different building. We don't even talk to each other. <laughs> so these all happen, bang, 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 all at a certain period of time. And I started, I started complaining quite a bit, and it became a put your money where your mouth is and try to do something about it. And that was among the things that spurred me to run. And I took the time to tell you that uh, s simply because I, I think I legitimately understand um, not all the specifics in your particular industries, but I understand what you face in New York. And I, 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 when that combination of my experience in business and walking, walking door to door, meeting people across the four counties and they're talking about jobs and taxes, those things became what my mission was when I got elected, to focus on that, to try to focus on, on fostering an environment conducive to the, the creation of private sector jobs. Because if we do that, if we can lower the size and cost of government, reduce regulations, you guys get to do more, and people like you and me with our business, we can expand, we can grow, we don't have the impediments, we create more jobs, people want to be here, people want to stay here. So I, I, I landed in the Senate and I was on a number of different committees including a couple of committees that, that Debbie mentioned. And last year I was then named Chair of Commerce, Economic Development and Small Business after Senator Lisi, who did chair that, announced that he was leaving. Um, I, I became Chair of that and we went to work. We again went throughout the district meeting with small businesses and chambers. We met with statewide groups like the Business Council, NFIB, Unshackle, Upstate, to talk about some of the things that our committee should be tackling. Now, that committee historically has just, they, they do a lot of budget time, but very few of the Senate committees are, are proactive in trying to do different things. Uh, it's very prescribed. If something is proposed under a certain law, or when it comes budget time and you have to review the budget, it's prescribed what laws and what departments go through the respective committees. But we thought we would try to do something different and put together our own agenda to try to move things forward. But our own agenda, I would like to say, is your agenda. And these were not all our original ideas. We came up with the different ideas because of what people talked about and where people highlighted some different problems. Now, for a period of time, I also chaired I, I also chaired the Social Services Committee, and I knew nothing about it, of course. My background was, was criminal justice, and now we're dealing with Medicaid and cash assistance, which is the old welfare. Uh, and I knew, no, I knew absolutely nothing about it, but I was fortunate enough to find an individual who used to be the state Medicaid director and 
Commissioner of the Office of Children and Fam I'm sorry, Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance, who had retired, was out working as a consultant, and he came on to help us with the committee work. So we were able to do some really neat things in holding these not-for-profit agencies accountable and demanding outcomes before we made recommendations for funding. But the other thing that we were able to do is put forward the idea of doing something with the biggest mandate of all, Medicaid. And we set about to try to do something about, about it. And what we tried to do and what we advocated for was for the state to take over the local share of Medicaid. Local share is approximately 15 to 20 percent, seven, seven and a half billion dollars statewide. I forget off the top of my head what Monroe County share, uh, what Monroe County share was, but it is the biggest consumer of county taxes across the state. So we set about doing that and moved across the state to try to do that, to take it off the backs of counties, property taxpayers, and fit it under a new cap on Medicaid. Medicaid had been increasing, I think it was like 10, 11% per year. If, it was around there. I, I'm not exact in that figure now. I don't have that off the top of my head anymore. But we had imposed a cap um, to tie it more in line to the medical component of the consumer price index. So it was essentially the same buying power so we could bring it down. So the idea was to take it off the back of property taxpayers, not just out of one pocket, pay it out of another, but then take it, jam it under the cap, and then with various reforms, reduce all that project, projected spending. And I think had what we tried to do been implemented, we would have saved over a course of, over a course of the first eight years when we were looking to phase it in, something in the neighborhood of 15 to $20 billion. Nonetheless, we were, not, we were not successful with a full takeover, but last year we were successful to get the governor to buy into some of it, and we've actually freezed froze the, sh the local share of Medicaid so it can't grow anymore. This past year, well, over a phase in of three years, beginning of this year, it'll save county taxpayers across the state $1.2 billion. I mentioned that, and I go back to the agenda that we were looking to put forward, which is this document right here, and you all have that <clears throat> in your folder there, and I'm not going to go through it, but I only mentioned the Medicaid and the social services because we set about trying to move that agenda forward for small business and the economy and commerce by taking things on two ways. First, cutting the size and cost of government. And then the other part, what we hear all the time from people, taxes and regulations, taxes and regulations, that so-called death by a thousand cuts. There are some big regulations that we would try to take on that affect everybody, that Wage Theft Prevention Act, where you've got to do that annual notification, that affects everybody. The scaffold law, people may not know it, Labor Law Section 240 drives up construction costs, drives up liability insurance costs. If people don't know it, it affects everybody. At the Public Works Projects, <coughs> excuse me, it affects all taxpayers. Unemployment insurance, workers' comp, those big things. But what, what we were looking for help with was things that are specific to your industry. What are the things, something that might have been put in place? The l liquor laws, this, uh, the liquor laws, the ABC laws, so many of them were put in place after prohibition in the 30s. There's things in there like you can't have a liquor store still today on a second floor. And that was because the police had to be able to see inside. Well, that's obsolete now. So we're trying to change something like that. But there's a whole host of things that are specific to that industry. So anyway, we put this together and it's a constant update. Along the way, there was a little bit of transition in Albany and those of you that may or may not have paid attention, we have this unique arrangement now. It isn't just Republicans in charge of the Senate, Democrats minority and vice versa. It's a working coalition of Democrats and Republicans. But as a result, my title changed and I became our conference leader for economic development. And now rather than me advancing an agenda, your agenda that we put together with the help of business, we, that essentially morphed into a conference-wide, a Senate-wide agenda, and you have this, that's now called a Blueprint for Jobs. And I'll just go through a few of the things on there um, because you, you do have this, but the whole idea is focusing on those two areas, cutting the size and cost of government, then dealing with the regulations. And we were pretty successful this year. We advanced this 
in February, we, we put this forward, and a number of these reforms were adopted in the budget. Uh, over $800 million in tax relief for collectively for small businesses across the state, a small business income tax exemption for certain businesses, um, the personal income tax, manufacturer tax rate reduction, that was about $120 million, a couple of uh, hiring credits, a phased-in reduction of a phased in reduction of that utility assessment, that 18A assessment, reforms unemployment insurance and workers' comp that are projected to ultimately save $1.2 billion, uh, making some money available to small business for low interest loans, all came about as a result of this, and we were able to get it in this year's budget. So uh, the other thing over the past several years that, that I neglected to say, and I, I put this up first, is if you think back of time that 2009, 2010, that 14 billion dollars of taxes and fees and the chaos of budget that went till August, they hadn't been on time in years and years. Over the past three years, I like to say because I was there, that really isn't the case, but there was new people in place. Um, people committed to trying to do the right thing and do their job. So you see some of the accomplishments, the on-time budgets, uh, the property tax cap, middle class tax cuts, lowest level in 15 years, some other different programs that help to affect business. So all these things are in place. Is it perfect? No, it isn't. But I would, I would suggest that the last three years that you've got a group of people actually trying and making some progress, clear progress, as compared to the 20 years prior. So this blueprint for jobs, I'm going to fly through it just a little bit for the sake of getting to Mark and Frank who I, I think uh, you guys will be really happy with, and it'll give you some things. I mean, learning about some of the things that Mark's involved in, how you can help, and some of the things that Frank will do this. Frank has, has been around the world dealing with Fortune 500 companies and talking about some specific marketing things to actually hopefully help you grow your businesses. But a lot of what is up here is said a different way, but the, the last thing that I want to talk about as part of this is the regulatory reform. So we know Startup New York. The, the governor has put that forward. It's a variation of um, his initial proposal of being tax free, somewhat controversial. We worked, it was his priority. We worked to, to do some things in there. Among the things that we were able to do, we included Rochester and Syracuse where they don't have a state university, that private colleges can be involved. Space off campus can be involved it will be another tax deduction instead of no income taxes. Another tax deduction like the 400 some deductions are, that are there. Should our tax code be reformed? Absolutely. Should we have all these tax deductions? No, probably not. Our real answer is, I think, lowering taxes, regulations of size and cost to government. But it's an effort to try to do something. But what we got in there that I am very excited about, and this is what I'm going to be looking for your help from, if not necessarily today, but, but as we move forward, is we advocated, we put together a whole package of, of, of proposals to try to do something about all the regulations in the state. There's, I think it's 83 volumes. That's 140,000 pages of regulations in New York State, that New York Code of Rules and Regulations, NYCRR, so all the things that affect your business, that the DEC might do, that the State Liquor Authority, State Liquor Authority for you, might do, that Department of Licensing, Health Department, they're in there, over 140,000 of them. So we put, we put all of these proposals forward. The idea is to move around the state, identify regulations. We set an initial goal of eliminating 1,000 rules and regulations, a report to the governor by the end of the year, calling on him to actually make that happen. There's over 140,000 pages. Why 1,000? We had to start somewhere. But what, what now with that Startup New York that we convinced the governor, there is actually now a regulatory relief commission in there with some teeth. That there's a mechanism for a business owner, a mechanism for a town supervisor to actually petition this committee and they then have steps that they have to follow. There's certain things that they have to do and ultimately, once you go through the appeals and all that stuff, ultimately, a change in the regulations can be forced if this committee says so. And that's a good thing. 
So along with that, what we're doing this summer is we will be moving around the state. Oh, sorry about that. Moving around the state, conducting a series of hearings, trying to talk to different business owners about things that are specific to your industry, that little thing that nags you, that might cost you 10 or 15 minutes of time each month, but it all adds up, that death by a thousand cuts. On the premise, if we can accomplish, if we can do something with all these little regulations one at a time, we can accomplish something good to ultimately help you. So I, I hope that uh, you get something out of today. I will be around after for questions that you have. Um, Annie, of course, is our representative here. Now that we're not in session anymore, I'd be thrilled if you invited me to your business to talk about some of the things that you have going on and some of the ways that I might be able to help. But our basic premise, what I had said before, we legitimately try to represent you and the people throughout the district. And the goal that I would have is that every time I vote, it's how you would vote. And you elect people to be your representative, and that's, that's how we're trying to do it. I can only be effective with this effort, with input from you guys and people like you and business owners across the state, getting down to the nitty gritty and identifying certain things. So we'll be, we of course have your contact information. We'll be asking for your input in your industry. We'll be trying to prod you hopefully and you can help identify things along with others so that we, we can ultimately be successful. But between Mark and Frank, I think we have a treat for you and I, I really hope you take something from it um, that, helps, that helps our region first of all and well, let's do it the other way. Helps your business. Helping your business, of course, ultimately helps the region. So thanks, thanks for being here, and I look forward to chatting with everybody a little bit later. Well, thank you, Senator, for that very um, comprehensive uh, introduction or uh, presentation. I, I want to mention a couple of things, say a couple of things about the Senator. Um, he has been tremendously accessible to us at RIT, and I know to the town of Henrietta on uh, the issues that we've wanted to deal with um, since becoming our state senator, and we really appreciate that support. And he mentioned the Startup New York program, and I want to take this opportunity to really reinforce uh, and to let you all know that it was really um, through the efforts of our delegation, Senator Gallivan, his colleagues in the Senate, and in the Assembly that got the language that enabled Rochester and Monroe County to have an equitable opportunity to participate in this program. So you'll be hearing more about it, but I, I did want to acknowledge those efforts. So thank you, Senator. Um, Mark Peterson, I'm sure, is chomping at the bit to get up here and uh, echo what the Senator said and, and offer uh, his suggestions. So I'm going to take the opportunity to introduce Mark now. Mark is President and CEO of Greater Rochester Enterprise, which is our regional economic development organization. He has an outstanding background in regional economic development, financial administration, and fundraising. He's been with GRE since 2005 and became president in April of 2009. Mark has been a tremendous advocate for the greater Rochester region. He has built a reputation among his colleagues as an exceptional leader and proactive change agent. I think that's a polite way of saying he's a pit bull, which I love. <laughs> <laughs> he is strongly invested in promoting the area, attracting quality businesses, and changing lives through job creation. And we work very closely with Mark at RIT to try to um, help our companies grow and to attract important new companies to our region. Mark is also a member of the Finger Lakes Regional Economic Development Council that was established by Governor Cuomo in 2011. He serves as a member of the Executive Committee. Please welcome Mark Peterson. Thank you, Debbie, and thank you uh, all for taking some time to be here. I have many friendly faces and friends I know in the audience. I actually, when move, we, my family moved back um, to the region 17 years ago. Our first home was in Henrietta, and uh, we're very proud of that, spent some time there, but you just didn't have a big enough house when my family got so big. So um, I appreciate very much the opportunity to spend some time with you. And Senator, I appreciate so much the invitation and your comments, um, which I think are unusual for um, state leadership uh, politically sometimes. Um, unfortunately, I'm probably going to uh, beat up on state government just a little bit in some of my comments because, you know, I often say, you know, I, I'm amazed at how in state government so many good people can come together to produce so many bad policies for business. It's absolutely 
unbelievable. And so I, I really don't fault the individual people, but we got on, you know, God, we have to change the system because it's clearly not working and we've got a lot of work to do. But I'm the advocate for the greater Rochester region. Um, you know, I'm bringing new companies to this region, my team and I. Um, we work very hard at that. Um, Paul Spronza from Wegman, some of you may know Paul, their general counsel, tells me I have the hardest job in the world because attracting new companies to this environment um, cannot be easy. And that's true. It's not easy. It's very competitive. It's very difficult in some ways. Uh, the good news is it's getting just a little bit better thanks to the work of uh, people like the senator and, uh, and, and some of the things that are coming out. But we have to keep the pressure on because there's so much more to do. Um, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about um, what we're doing in the area of small businesses, and, and it won't hit right the fairway to some of the people that are in this room. But I want you to understand that you're not being ignored because you'll hear a lot of times in the press a lot more discussions about big companies we're trying to attract, and you'll hear about you know startup work that we're doing and venture capital, and all of those are important, and we're going to chat about those for a little bit. But the number one thing that makes this community and this region grow is businesses like yours. And we're going to talk about that. And the number one thing, and that's why that's our tagline that is going to keep this region strong and keep it growing, is smart people. It's our talent. It's people like you that fight every day. You have to be a lot more competitive than some other people you are out there against because you live in this environment, you work in this community. Now the good news is it's a great place to live. It does have some advantages and you all know that. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about that talent, you know, where smart people live, where smart businesses grow, um, and how we might work together to change that environment and make it even better. So just to give you an over, over, overview, the, you know, this is our mission statement. You always got to put this up when you're talking to an audience that might not know who your organization is. But the one word I want you to focus on is our job is to bring a unified approach to economic development. Now think about it. Look at all the different kinds of organizations we partner with. Debbie mentioned RIT. I partner with the universities. I partner with the government on partners. I partner with business community trying to get all of those entities to work together so that it looks seamless to a new company we're attracting is not the easiest thing in the world to do. But it is the competitive advantage if we're successful. And I think we've proved in the last 10 years that being collaborative and really being on the whole page and working together does get us to win. And we're going to talk about how we do that. This is the space that we cover. It's the nine county Finger Lakes region, same as defined by the Finger Lakes Regional Councils that we serve on. You know, just to give you some perspective of what this task is, I have 10 people on my staff. We cover ground that is bigger than the state of Connecticut, okay, as far as attracting new companies and helping businesses. So um, what I'm telling you is I'm going to tell you at the end of all of this that if I can help any of your businesses, call me. Uh, give me 24 hours to call you back, though, okay? Because there's a lot of stuff going on, and it's a big ground to tear. And I think we need to do more in this space. And we have too many bureaucrats and not enough organizations like ours that are privately funded by the business community working for you in order to achieve some of our economic outcomes. And that really is the difference between our state and other states, OK, in a lot of ways. So little history lesson very briefly. We all know this. For a long, long time, years and years, we were a company town. We were the big three. In fact, the big four, I would like to call it, Gleason Works, Bausch & Lomb, Xerox, and Kodak, accounted in eight, 1982 for 60% of all of the employment in this region. 60%. Almost everybody worked for one of those big four, okay? Small business, yeah, you were supporting, you were there, but you weren't the players necessarily, okay? They, you weren't making the decisions, you weren't driving the economy. How has it changed now? 30 years later, 97% of all the companies that exist in our region have fewer than 100 employees. And I would suspect a lot of you fall into that category. So it's a massive change. The good news is those big companies have been replaced by another set of stable entities, which is really good, which is our universities. Our universities and our healthcare system provide the stability and the employment that helps us to have a nice foundation to remain stable in a lot of ways. The U of R and IOT, RIT, as much as they want to improve things and everything, and they are doing a great job of it, they're not going to move. That's the good news. Debbie and Bill Dessler cannot pack up their toys 
pack up this building and go to another state. Most all of you can't, okay? They can't. So that's a good thing, because that provides a foundation of stability for our economy, okay? But what also has changed is that we don't know how to define ourselves. When I'm out marketing in the region, people say, okay, here's the conclusion. Do you all take logic when you were in college? Here's the conclusion. Rochester is Kodak, Kodak is bankrupt, Rochester is bankrupt. Is that not the logical path? Of course it is, but there's nothing farther from the truth. Right now, there are more, there are 21% more people employed per capita than there were 30 years ago when those four companies were the big four. 21%. Yet it's been very incremental, it's been very changed, and now we have a highly diversified economy that has everything from optics and high technology and lasers and sustainability institutes to food processing, yogurt capital of the world, all those kind of biggest producer of tomato paste in the world, all those are true too. So how do you say, well, what is the greater Rochester economy? What drives it? Is it manufacturing? Is it the service sector? Is it our great small businesses? Is it our universities? It's none of those, it's all of them. And that's the challenge with getting the message out. But the one thing that's overreaching to all of that is we gotta have better regulatory policies, we got to make it easier for business to grow faster. We got to make it easier for us to find and keep and retain talent. Those things cut across all industry sectors. So that's some of the things we focus on. To give you some hope, there is new growth. These are some of the companies that have been recruited to the region or companies that are already here that are experiencing really strong exponential growth. To build the regional economy, three things have to, ha have to happen. You have to have new companies spinning out, growing, starting up, out of our great universities like RIT and U of R, out of some of the other things that are going on at the big uh, uh, can uh, companies, spin-offs out of those. That is happening. Uh, you have to be able to have existing companies reinvest. Companies like Ledestri Foods, you know, reinvesting into this community. Harris Corporation, Optimation, these are all companies that are here that are experiencing massive growth right now. They're in an industry sector that is growing and that we're helping to feed. And all these other companies that are new, Omni ID, Quintel, Intrinsic Materials, three companies recruited from the United Kingdom by our organization, now living at Eastman Business Park. Okay, all high technology, all fast growing companies. So we have all of the elements in place and this didn't exist 10 years ago. There's reason to be hopeful because 10 years ago, we weren't firing on all cylinders and you have to have growth in all these categories. But I'm gonna talk a little bit about your businesses in one area that I think we're still missing. Some of the things that we do to try help businesses grow, the International Business Council. If you're, whether you're a small or a medium-sized business, you know, many of you are for the first time breaking into international markets. Playing in that space is a great opportunity, but it also has risk associated with it. And so getting the good kind of counsel, um, being referred to people who've already done business in other countries. If you're thinking about doing business, I don't care if it's across the border in Canada or Mexico or internationally all over the world in Asia, call us. We have the resources can plug you into people that can walk you through all of that uh, at very low cost or no cost and you can get that done and do it right and make sure that it's a profitable new market for your company. You know, we work with the Economic Gardening Program, we're gonna talk about it in a minute. We work with NYSERDA programs, we do everything to bring new dollars in, uh, into the region. But here's the challenge, folks. We hear a lot about startups. We hear a lot about we need more money for startups. We hear a lot about, you know, existing, you know, recruiting new companies and we're gonna cut the ribbon and we, you know, we, had, we gave all these benefits to this new company. Look. I'm playing in that game, we've got to do that. That's an important part of building a regional economy. But equally important and more important in some places, and when I say small businesses, I'm not defining small businesses in this chart as your businesses are defined. I'm defining your businesses as, as existing growth companies, okay? Because the small businesses represented here are, um, you know, the local pizza shop, okay? Those are good, but those are what we tend to focus more on in, in a, a, an economic development program. What we don't do enough to focus on is existing growth companies. Companies that are you know, in a category where they have 10 employees to 99 employees, where they have a million to 50 million in revenue, where they're experiencing growth but with a little help could experience more rapid growth. 
what what is driving them to that success and they need special things they need special attention and that's why we engaged in something called the economic gardening program this program focuses on companies like many of your companies that are in a growth mode growth issues versus survival issues you know we're not talking about companies that are like well we're trying to keep the doors open and we haven't made a profit in four years I'm talking about companies that have had their ups and downs, but have a revenue stream, have customers, you know, are making it work, um, but need some special attention in order to go to the next level. These are the kinds of companies that every research statistical number will tell you. They create the most jobs in our economy, nationwide and in this region. They attract the most money, new investment. They attract companies, other companies to partner with, to merge with, to do acquisitions from. Um, they attract talent, and they drive the culture of the community. They are the ones. But see, it's a very different tool. It was very different when four CEOs could get together and decide what the policies for this region were going to be for the next four years. They do that over br breakfast. Now we're not as organized. And that's why I give the senator so much credit for bringing you all together here. I hope we do more of these kinds of things because we need you all to meet each other. We need you to dialogue, find common ground, to be able to work together because that collaboration is hard and it's messy, but it is the way to economic prosperity and I can show you reasons why. So what are we doing to, to pilot this economic garden program? This is a program that's been done in, in, uh, in Florida successfully. It's been done in the state of Michigan right now. My counterpart, uh, two CEOs ago at GRE, went back and is now running economic development for the state of, New York, uh, the state of Michigan. And uh, he just invested $6 million in a statewide program in economic gardening, targeting companies like yours for growth. Um, we did the first program this last year in economic gardening, a pilot program um, in New York State, the first of its kind ever done. And we got a whopping $200,000 grant from the Finger Lakes Regional Council in order to do that. Um, through the council process, and then the second year, New York State promptly cut all the funding for those kinds of programs. So we're really getting on top of it that, you know, they got it right to fund the right program, and then we cut our legs out from underneath us so that we couldn't get the full benefit of it. Fabulous. But what this program really does is does, it puts together in partnership with a group called the Edward Lowe Foundation. Many of you would never have heard of them. They're an operating foundation that was founded by the man who invented kitty litter. So you can say in some sense kitty litter is driving some economic progress in the Finger Lakes right now, so we're pretty excited about that. But the reality is what we do is we put a virtual team of experts from all over the country together to work with companies on the two or three issues that are keeping them from going to the next level, from hiring the new people. And I'm, I'm not going to have time today to get into all the details of the program. You can go to our website. There's a lot of information on it. It's RochesterBiz, RochesterBiz.com. And I encourage all of you to do that because we're, we're, we're putting together some alternative funding to be able to continue to work with this program. But these people are specially trained experts. Imagine that you could take the number one small business expert on developing websites in the world and have an hour of his time free of charge. Imagine you had the number one expert in the country about defining new markets and new competitive opportunities for you and you got to talk to him for an hour free. Okay, Would that be worth anything to you? Okay, that's what the program is really all about. So we do those strategic analysis. It's really focused on expanding and identifying your existing markets, going to the new level, absorbing information, applying it appropriately, working very hard to make sure um, that we can have nice, strong, incremental growth. Grow your business. If you're growing at 2 or 3% a year, can we get you to grow 5 and 10% a year? And can we do that over a prolonged period of time? This program was originally tried in uh, uh, Littleton, Colorado, about 20 years ago, all right, and it was because their largest employer of 30,000 people left town, went out of business and left. So they suddenly had this huge hole in their community. So they started to work with individual small businesses to grow them as rapidly as could. Over a 10-year period of time, they produced thousands of new jobs, revitalized their economy. There's no reason we can't do the same kinds of things here, even given that challenging environment. These were the participating companies in our first round, 20 companies. We'd originally proposed doing 50, but as I said, um, you know, it was a pilot project. We did 20 companies, and these are some of the outcomes of those companies. Two of the companies are already planning to buy other companies now this year, and they're in that process right now for expansion. Several of them have hired new sales reps, um, launched websites for the first time. Three of them never had a website. 
opening the website alone tripled their sales. Okay, now I know that sounds very simple, but if you're a company and you're just trying to make it all work sometimes, you know, even getting on the web in the right way to the right market can be a huge leap for you. All right, so we did a lot of those kinds of things for those companies. Now what we've done is we've got a, a grant from the Farish Foundation. I couldn't uh, rely on any public support for this program. So the Farish Foundation has stepped up and filled the gap with some additional funding for us to continue to work in these programs. But I want to emphasize this is a very small pilot program. It's very targeted on certain kinds of companies. But I will tell you right now, if we get our act together, this is the kind of attention to small and medium-sized businesses that will radically change. If we had a program like this funded at $500,000 a year, all right, in the 10 regions, okay, so there's $5 million a year, Right? We spend more than that on one big attraction project in, in one little community. $5 million a year for five years, we could create 35,000 new jobs in our communities in the state of New York. That's my challenge to the governor. That's my challenge to our regional council, is we have to start focusing on programs that really work, not on incremental changes that put a Band-Aid on a bad situation. Senator, in all due respect, I, I love everything that you said. Um, let's blow the whole system up and start over, though, because I'm going to tell you, you keep putting Band-Aids on this thing, you're just going to have something that doesn't bleed quite as much. There's a problem here. we got to fix it. You know it. I know it. Okay? There are specific things that we could do right now that will ease the pain, and I'm pleased that the senator is working on those things. But in the long stead, we have to start implementing policies like this that are going to be able to, uh, to really save our communities and build jobs. A lot of the stuff I talked about today is available through our mobile app. You can download it for free, so take care. Everything that exists on our website that promotes this region talks about positive things about the region. If you're frustrated with your friends who say, ah, oh, why the hell are you doing business in New York State? Give them something, some ammunition that uh, you can respond to. Go to our website, download it. All the stuff that's on our website is yours. You're the business community that supports us. I want you to take it. It's yours for free if you need it. In another format, call me and I'll give it to you. And uh, I thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me this morning. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mark. So um, all I have to say is if enthusiasm is a key to success, I think we're in good hands. So thank you very much, Mark, and thank you for your leadership of GRE. Um, our next presenter is Frank Switek. Uh, Frank was appointed by Senator Gallivan as his senior advisor for small business. He has conducted over 3,450 management, sales, and marketing sessions for organizations throughout the United States and China. He's worked for over 25 Fortune 500 companies, as well as numerous small businesses. He recently co-authored a book with the former president and CEO of Verizon Wireless, Denny Striegel. The book is, a, is called Managers, Can You Hear Me Now? Hard-hitting lessons on how to get real results. Published by McGraw-Hill in New York City, it is available in over 40 countries. Frank's recent focus is on small businesses, which he calls the backbone of America. And um, I think it's a, it's a perfect complement to Mark's presentation. He has conducted national marketing uh, webinars and boot camps for small businesses in western New York, New York City, New Jersey, and Connecticut. So please welcome Frank Switek. Good job, good job. Hello, everybody. Good to, good to be with you uh, this morning. I'm delighted to be with you. I'm flattered, as I'm sure Mark and the Senator are, that you shared uh, an important part of your day with us. And we want to certainly make it uh, worthwhile to uh, each and every one of you. And, you know, this is a marketing gold mine in here, a networking gold mine, as Mark alluded to. Uh, people from every sector are here. Uh, you know, the public sector, the private sector, the not-for-profit sector, we got people in manufacturing, we got people in retail, we have uh, people in banking. We're the bankers in the room. Well, well, quite a bit. I'm a former banker. So I'm doing a session in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I got 25 bankers in the room and I start out by saying, I'm a former banker. Banker in the front row looks up, he goes, that's my goal too. <laughs> <laughs> So I hope that's not your goal here. Okay, I hope that's not your goal of being here today. So what, what determines marketing success? Why do some businesses hit their marketing right out of the ballpark and some struggle? What is it in those businesses that are succeeding that is missing and those that are, in fact, failing? 
All my life, for the 30 years I've been in business and consulting, I focused on differences. What makes a difference between a person who wins an election, a person who loses an election? What's the difference between a salesperson who succeeds and a salesperson who doesn't succeed? A manager who succeeds, doesn't succeed. What's the difference between a team that succeeds and doesn't succeed? So I'm talking to you today about some of these differences, okay? And I want to keep it simple. Now, 20 minutes is not a lot of time. So what I'm going to do is give you an overview of what I think is really important. And then, sometime after this seminar, you are going to get an email with an attachment for a 54-page ebook, free of charge, courtesy of the senator, called 17 Breakthrough Marketing Lessons for Small Business Owners with Big Dreams. Fair enough? Okay, fair enough. So I'm, I'm going to provide the overview for you here this morning. We mentioned Denny Striegel uh, and the book. One of the things I learned, and by the way, the growth at Verizon, 20 years he grew the business from 192 million to 62 billion. So whatever you're doing in sales, multiply it 325 times. Staggering, right? Pretty staggering. And you know what? Keep it simple. Managers want to know how to succeed. Here he says, every single day, if you're not focusing on driving revenue, bringing in new customers, keeping the customers you already have, and cutting costs, ask yourself, why are you doing it? Every day. I mean, just very, we have a book, a chapter in the book called Keep It Simple. And Denny really kept it simple. So we want to talk about some of these simple ideas that really, really work. So let's take a look at one of the simple ideas. And you have that in your, in your handout. The people that succeed are doing the right things in the right way. I'm, not, I'm sure you're not thrilled with that. But you say, you say what are the right things and what, what are the right ways? Well, for us, it's based on our case studies. It's based on the real world. It's based on our experiences. It's based on uh, research that we've done. So you can do things right. Now, in marketing and sales, things is what you do. Do you do social media? You're not, you do social media. Do you use the website? We talked about the website. Do you not do it? Use the website. The ways you do them is how you do it. So people will say to me, oh, I've tried direct mail and it didn't work. See what happens sometimes, you, you overlearn from an initial experience. I said, okay, let's, let's talk about that. So I take a look at the piece of direct mail and I, I, I could see seven reasons why it didn't work. You see, it, they did it the wrong way. They did it the wrong way. So what you end up with is you end up with four different quadrants. If you're doing the wrong thing in the wrong way, it's activity down here. So if you go to a poorly attended trade show with an amateur looking booth, <laughs> right? You're doing the wrong things in the wrong way. This is a good way to audit your business. Very good way to audit your business. Now, you could be doing the right thing in the, whoops, I'm sorry. You could be doing the right thing in the wrong way. So you could have a website, as Mark pointed out, but if it's not generating <coughs> leads for you or not generating business for you, you have a brochure website, not a lead generating or a sales generating website. You see, so that would be doing the right thing, but you're not getting results because you're doing it the wrong way, all right? Now, if you're doing the wrong thing, you might do it the right way. So, <laughs> crazy, right? So, you don't have a marketing system, but you got a great brochure that's customer focused. You see? That's why it isn't working. And then the right thing, the right way, would be, uh, as an example, you have a good core marketing message, and it's on everything. It's on, you're, you're integrating it on everything that you do. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So, what are the differences? Well, one of the differences that we find 
is you want to ensure a market opportunity. And there's you know, plenty of resources in this room that can help you uh, and determine whether you have a marketing opportunity. Sometimes people will call me in and say, Frank, we need a prospecting program. We've got to generate new prospects. I say, fine, well, let's, let's take a look at what's happening, what's going on. So I was working in the aftermarket, auto aftermarket radiator company. The problem wasn't prospecting. They were in a saturated market. And they started out with about a 31, 32% margin, and in three years, they're down to 17. They said, what do we do? I said, sell the business while it still has value. <laughs> You know, 1-800 radiator was coming, overseas was coming, it was saturated. That's exactly what they did. It was just saturated. So an insurance market opportunity. The next two things are really important. If you have any defects in your products or services, fix them and fix them fast. And second, and thirdly, deliver on the promise of your product or service. If you're a mattress company, there's a mattress company out there that says, we sell mattresses for a lot less. For less, a lot less. That better be true, right? Now, why? This is really interesting. When we first started doing customer service as a marketing strategy in the 90s, we depended on the TARP studies. Anybody ever hear of the TARP? Technical Assistant Research Program in Vienna, Virginia. They said, when you have a satisfied customer, 12 people will hear about it. Dissatisfied, 73. Because you'll tell 12 and 12 will tell 5 and you do the math, it turns out to be 73. How do you think the internet has changed that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> huh? How do you think social media has changed that? I've got a couple of examples in here, actual examples. Then communicating with integrity, and you need a strong inner game. Uh, Mark kind of alluded to it, and I think Pat did as well. Uh, being a small business owner, is not for the faint-hearted, <laughs> all right? It is not for the faint-hearted. There's a lot of obstacles, a lot of barriers, but sometimes the inner game begins to suffer. So sometimes you'll find, I'll find managers of small businesses who want to cling to the status quo. They do everything their competitors do, a little more, a little less, but nothing different. See, nothing different, a little more, Little less, but nothing different. Or you'll find that they get jaded. They get the attitude, been there, done that, got the t-shirt. <laughs> and so they close out all new information. Okay, they close out all new information. Uh, or they start to focus excessively on why they should not succeed. And why they should fail. External obstacles. It was interesting to see Nick Walinda, you see the, the walk the other day with Nick? And his great grandfather, when he fell in Puerto Rico, his wife said it was the first time he put all his energies into not failing. Checking the wires, and he fell, he fell. He's, sometimes people put all their energies into focusing on things that they don't control. So I wanna to talk to you today about some things you can't control. So the senator talked about things at the state level. Mark talked about the great resources that are available for you. I want to talk to you a little bit about what you can do for yourself. Okay, what you can do for yourself. So I mentioned customer service is the new marketing. Now this is Jeff Jarvis. Had an unhappy experience with Dell. Went on buzzmachine.com, sent an open letter to uh, Michael Dell. Others jumped in. Consumers went to Dell's site, posted harsh messages. And anybody who Googled Dell, just to find out where I could get some products, they were met with all these messages. Thousands upon thousands heard about it from one person. <laughs> Big difference from 73, right? Huge difference. All right, then you got Bob Garfield, received poor unresponsive service by Comcast. He launched a site, ComcastMustDie.com. <laughs> you can do this so simple today, right? Go daddy, 10 bucks, and you got a site. And you're viral. That, that's how quick it happens. So he got over 700 supportive comments. Now here's Vince Ferrari called to cancel his AOL account. Representative was rude, refused to cancel. At one point, the representative said he wanted to talk to Ferrari's father. <laughs> Is that like a, an insult? You're not capable of dealing with it yourself? 
He recorded the conversation, posted it on YouTube, 62,827 views. He was called by NBC, New York Times, and he appeared on today's show. So my advice and customer service to you is this. Be afraid. <laughs> be very afraid. See, it isn't 73 more. It's now thousands upon thousands upon thousands. So what is your major selling obstacle? Your major selling obstacle and marketing obstacle is your prospect's preoccupation barrier. Whatever you're doing, it's, it's the preoccupation. Whether you're running for public office, whether you, you're, in, you're in retail, you're in manufacturing, they are bombarded, and I've got research that shows anywhere from 1,500 to 4,000 marketing messages a day. I've averaged it out to 2,500 a day. So what are your prospects thinking about? They're thinking about, if you talk about business, their pains in their business, their frustrations, their challenges, their fears, their problems, their troubles, their interests, their difficulties, their worries. If you want to be successful in marketing, you want to write this next sentence down. Enter the conversation that's taking place in the customer's mind. If you want to be successful, enter the conversation that's taking place in the customer's mind. What are they worried about? What are they concerned about? What pains are they experiencing? You see? And so what you present, we always talk about give people a headache and then provide the aspirin. Marketing technique, give people a headache, then provide the aspirin. How to get rid of the pain, or how to ensure the pain doesn't happen in the first place. Okay, so the preoccupation barrier. So what do I find in marketing? I find that most marketing messages are too tepid. What does that mean? Renee? Not hot, not cold, just lukewarm. They don't hit hard enough. They don't hit hard enough, right? They're, they just don't do a good job of hitting hard. They don't capture attention. On the internet, you've roughly got, or in, in a direct mail piece, you got about three to seven seconds. So what do people see in three to seven seconds? They see a lot of messages. But not about their pain, not about their worries, not about their concerns, you see? So let's do an experiment. Do an experiment with me now. One minute experiment, ready? You'll need your pen for this. So let's assume you and I met. And I find out what you do. I'm a town supervisor. I run a manufacturing company. And I'm going to ask you a question. And remember, if I ask you a question and we're verbalizing, you have no time to think. Right? You've got to respond. So as soon as I ask you this question, I want you to write a paragraph. Are you ready? I'm not worried about grammar or sentence structure. Nothing like that. Just a paragraph. Are you ready? Why should I do business with you? Right. Why should I vote for you? Okay, let's stop. Count for me the number of times you named your company, number of times you used I, we, us, and our. And jot it down. How many times did you? Did you name your company and say, I, we, us, and our? And then count the number of times you used you and your. Here's what we recommend. At least two to one, you and yours to I, we, uh, us, and our, okay? So there's two kinds of marketing messages. One is a WWD message, what we do. People don't care. <laughs> they care about their lives, their problems. WW, call it as of a radio station, WIIFM, prospecting messages are what's in it for me. What's in it for me? So there's got to be something in it for them in your marketing. So that's one piece to make your messages more compelling on the internet. Uh, and and uh, any, any piece of paper you have. Secondly, headlines that are intriguing and capture prospect, prospect attention. It's amazing how many times I see sales materials with no headlines. No headlines at all that are intriguing. In the book, if you want to download the book that you'll get from the senator, there's going to be 21 headline templates for you. 
that you can take your product and your service and just adapt it. And these are all tested headlines. These are headlines that have worked, okay? So you, you'll have that. Pain and fear outsells gain five to one. So a pain message to somebody will capture more attention. So we've done, as an example, in Arizona, they were talking about installing some new systems that will, you'll gain more money every month versus a system that it'll prevent you from losing money. The losing had five more, five more times responses than the gain one, okay? So people don't want to lose. And then finally, emotions will outsell logic. And that's five to one too. Wall Street Journal sold a billion dollars in subscriptions. Now, you, when you think about what do they sell, right? IPOs, data, stock prices, hardly the stuff of emotion. They told a story of two young people that graduated from college. And they both went back after they graduated. And they both had similar lives. One became the president, one became a department head. What made the difference? Information. All emotion. What was that? There was a hidden emotion there. Don't be left out. Don't be left out. A billion dollars. Arguably, arguably the most successful direct mail letter piece ever. So let's, let's take a look how this works in the real world. Harvard University has a health letter. Anybody subscribe to the Harvard University health letter? It's a good one. So they want to sell more of the letters. They're having a lot of competition. So the marketing department comes up, comes up with something very unique and different. And it just raised an uproar in Cambridge. So here's what they came up with. And the board of directors said, this is unharvard like This is in, not in keeping with our distinguished reputation. So they persisted and persisted and persisted. So the message is, if anyone suggests you take the health supplement named inside, just say no, not on your life, says who? The doctors at the Harvard Medical School, that's who. Pretty hard hitting? 60% increase in subscriptions with that message. But notice, it was breaking the status quo, remember? The status quo? So, as in life, you want to be sure that you're moving outside your comfort zone. Your comfort zone is your enemy. It keeps you where you're at. It's true in sales, it's true in marketing, and it's true in your personal life. It keeps you where you're at. All right. Keeping things simple. Here's what we focus on. Three things. You can grow your business by increasing the number of prospects that you have. You can grow your business by increasing your conversion rate. Or you can grow your business by ensuring the long-term value of the customer. We have somebody in, uh, in, in Dallas, Cadillac dealer, long-term value of a customer is $400,000. That's an asset. It's an asset you want to protect. See, why wouldn't you give a free oil change? It's an asset you want to protect. So the nifty thing about this is that sometimes companies don't know where their problems are. So we had a company call, daycare center. We want to increase our marketing. We got a marketing budget. And I said to them, tell me about your numbers. What do, what do your numbers look like? So what we find is, but let me go back here a second. I'm gonna move. So what we find is that, I said, how many new prospects are you touching a month from all sources? We don't know. So they get drive-bys, people drive by daycare center, stop in. They get people emailing for information. They get people visiting your website. I, I said, when they visit your website, do you capture email addresses? Do you give some high value content away so that people will give you your email? Do you begin a sales conversation on the internet with, with those folks? So how, are you, how many are you touching a month? We don't know. How many prospects are buying a month? In their case, what would happen is they would give tours, and those tours would result in enrollments. So once we got the numbers, we knew where the problem was. It was not in the marketing, in the prospecting, it was in the conversion rate. They didn't need more marketing, they needed sales training. 
So we, they were at, we found out about a 37% closing ratio. We instituted a program called Influencing with Integrity. The closing ratio went on average for 12 center directors to 75%, with one director doing 93%. Now, what's the point? Sometimes you attack the wrong problem. See, we, we believe that, and I learned this from Verizon. I was a, I was a outside performance consultant for 16 years for them for that, during that 20 year period. You can market, sell, or manage yourself out of most situations. Sometimes the problem is management. We were talking earlier today. Problem I'm finding is small businesses is they tolerate poor performance. Why do you think small businesses tolerate poor performance? It's a pain in the butt to get into the hiring process, right? So I, I mean, a week ago, I'm at, I'm at a place. They had 12 salespeople. I said, how many people are hitting their numbers? Two. I says, all right, are they on performance? Oh, we don't really use performance improvement plans. <laughs> we don't really evaluate. That's a management problem. It is not a marketing problem. It is not a sales problem. It's a management problem. You see, if you're not holding people's feet to the fire for the results they're accountable for, that is a management problem. So what is your average sale? And this is very important. The data speaks. So when you start getting your touch points, you know the conversion. Data. I have learned more about marketing and selling from quality engineering. I was part of the quality movement, now called Six Sigma. And from my accounting degree as a former financial officer and a treasurer, I have learned more about marketing from those two fields. Why? Because quality engineering teaches you about the importance of systems. Results occur, good or bad, because the system is in place producing it. So what's your marketing system? What's your sales system? What's your customer service system? You see, very, very important. Very important. And what have I learned? I've learned from accounting, the data speaks. See, the data, you can argue all day whether we should try something or not, you do it, run a test, the data will tell you whether you should do it or not. See, the data speaks. So, <clears throat> random marketing, I find, I find a lot of this going on. Okay, throwing money at marketing, I call that barnyard marketing. You throw a lot of stuff against the barnyard door and you hope something sticks. Or sometimes some businesses are just at the mercy of the marketplace. Silver bullet marketing. First it was the internet. Oh, I can't wait for the internet. It's going to really grow my business. And then in social media. Well, it can if you do it the right way. You see? By, in and by itself, it's not going to happen. So here's, and I'll, I'll wrap with this. We're getting close. Here's what I recommend. And by the way, there's a lot of marketing systems. This is one, like in golf, there's a lot of different ways to get to the hole. So this is one system that we use that we know. In fact, we even guarantee results if people use this system. Capture your core sales numbers. Track your core sales numbers for a period of time, for a month, so you get a benchmark. Map results, develop your ratios. So how many touches do we have? to qualified leads. So we, now you got to start asking questions. Why aren't we getting more qualified leads from the touches? Qualified leads to appointments. See, the weakness could be there. We're not getting enough appointments. Appointments to sales. So evaluate your results, and you're forever doing this, tweaking and optimizing. Every step. You'll find, have got a number of charts in there on tweaking and optimizing. And how you do that, and you put a little note for yourself, is you ask optimization questions for every step of the process. And then you create a, a, a sustainable and repeatable process. So I'll just finish with this one, and you have it in your book. So what are some key optimization questions for each step? So here's a retail store we work with, mails 500 pieces to prospects with a coupon. Well, should we be using direct response advertising? Should we develop a referral program? Networking. Can we do some joint promotions? Business alliances is the fastest way to grow your business. The fastest. So working with a daycare center, develop an alliance with Babies R Us. Babies R Us has 5,000 in their database. They make an offer on behalf of the 
daycare center. The daycare center makes an offer on behalf of uh, Babies Are Us. Doubled their prospects with one visit. With one visit. So there's a lot of opportunities. And I just want to do the overview. When you get the ebook, you're going to find there's a lot of real life examples. Uh, a lot of case studies in there that'll really help you. So what's our, what's our wish to you as we finish up today? Finish 2013 strong and make 2014 a year to remember. Thank you, appreciate it, thanks. <laughs>